Since I began making these videos last year around the holiday season, I, I've had a number of, uh, of email requests asking me if I would expand a bit on my, my experience with Dr. Richard Ireland, a well-known psychic back in the 60s and 70s, uh, who was uh, a very well-known throughout the Hollywood film industry. He was really a, a groundbreaking uh, psychic. And um, so I'm going to do that. I want to give you a little backstory first, though. Uh, in, in the mid-60s, I, I was in high school, and I had a girlfriend by the name of Susie. I'll call her Susie to, uh, you know, to protect her, uh, her privacy. Um, and we were uh, an on-again, off-again boyfriend-girlfriend. Um, Susie um, was, um, I met her at the beach, at Sorrento Beach one summer, and we just hit it off almost from the start. And uh, we became uh, romantically involved. Uh, we were having uh, sexual relations uh, uh, in high school. And um, then there was a period of time when we broke up that she wasn't in school. She just kind of dropped out. And I didn't really pay much attention to it because I wasn't going with her anymore. And then uh, my, my life uh, kind of derailed. I got expelled from high school and... Uh, um, you know, I, I, it, it took me a while to get my life back on track, and I went to, I went to community college and on to UCLA. And it was around that time in the late '60s that I, that I uh, reconnected with Susie, and I drove to her house. We were going out to a party or dinner or something, and when the when the door was answered, I noticed a little boy in the uh, in her home. He's probably two or three years old. Kind of a he was walking around and. When we left her home, I said, by the way, who's the, who's, who's the little boy in the house? She said, oh, that's my brother. My, my parents adopted him. She came from a very well-to-do family. Her mother uh, was a college professor. Her father was a professional. Um, they lived in Beverly Hills, very, very well-established family. And she said that her mother and father had adopted the little boy. They had three daughters already, of which Susie was one of them. I didn't think much of it. We went out, we saw each other for a while, and and then we, we didn't see each other for a while. And I got involved in the film industry with Blake Edwards. And um, there were times when I started thinking about this little boy and I thought, you know, why would her parents adopt a, a little child? They were beyond their, you know, childbearing age. Why would they do that? They already had three kids. I kind of wondered. And then I started to add up the, you know, I would do the math and I'd say, you know, is that, I mean, he looked an awful lot like Susie. So one time I asked her if, that was her, her child, and she, she admitted it. She said, yes, I, that's what, that was the reason that she dropped out of school and that uh, she gave birth to the boy and that her parents had adopted the child. And of course, I asked if I was the father, and she said, no, you're not. Uh, and she gave me the name of the, of the person who was the father. And he was dark hair, and uh, you know, he didn't look anything like me. And uh, I kind of let it go at that. And then uh, we didn't see each other again for a while, and then we started seeing each other again. And it was around that time that I was working for Blake Edwards, and um, my mother was dating a, um, um, a television writer, a sitcom writer by the name of Robert Fisher. And Fisher had a writing partner uh, named Arthur Marx, who was Groucho Marx's son. They were very successful. They had a number of successful sitcoms. They'd done some... Uh, I think they'd done some stage plays and they had a very successful writing team. And Robert Fisher was very connected in Hollywood. And, and so was Arthur Marks for that matter. And one afternoon, uh, my mother invited me to come to uh, the home of Mae West where Dr. Richard Ireland was going to give a, uh, 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 a private showing, asked if I would be interested in going. And I thought, gee, I didn't know anything about Ireland, but I knew who Mae West was. I thought, God, what an opportunity to meet Mae West. And I knew where she lived. She lived in that big green house next, a little bit north of Sorrento Beach. Everybody knew that house was big. And that's where I was always told that house belongs to Mae West. And that's where I used to go to the beach, just a little bit to the south. So I said, yeah, I'd love to go. And I was, uh, I was uh, allowed to bring a date, which I brought Susie, because at that time we were dating. So that's, that's the backstory to my... Um, my meeting with uh, with Dr. Ireland and going to the private showing. 
uh, I'm going to put a link down in, in the in the in the um, in the comments that will that will show, uh, which will go to a um, an episode on um, uh, Steve Allen when Dr. Ireland appeared on the Steve Allen show, and you'll get an idea of what he does. Um, his psychic ability is said to have uh, started when he was five years old. He had had an operation on his eyes. He was admitted to the hospital, and after the operation, they had put bandages on his eyes and the nurses uh, told him that well they actually strapped his arms down to the railings of his bed and he didn't he had a really hard time with that and he promised that they would take those those bandages off those uh, off of his arms and you know free his arms from the railing that he would he promised not to touch the bandages and later on the nurse came down the hall to find him hitting a ball up against the wall and he said, oh my god he's torn those bandages off and she raised well the bandages weren't turned off they were on, and uh, he found that he could see without the use of his eyes, and that's how he always did his show. He would bandage his eyes up, and then he would, he would, you know, drop into his psychic realm. When I arrived at Robert Fisher's house with uh, my date Susie and my mother, uh, we were uh, shown into the foyer where, uh, and then on into the living room where there was a big bowl, it was almost like a huge salad bowl, a glass bowl with uh, note cards, uh, they're like five by, you know, little index cards, almost like the size of an index card and an envelope and a bunch of pens. And the idea was you were to write, write uh, two questions on the index card and seal it and then you were going to put it in the bowl. And uh, I, that bowl was never out of anybody's sight. It was always in plain view. Uh, so we all gathered. A lot of people sat on the sofas, some people sat on the floor, and I sat in the back of the living room with Susie. And Dr. Ireland appeared, and, and uh, he uh, went through the bandaging. And you'll see this on the Steve Allen segment where he bandaged his eyes and had people come up and look everywhere and said, no, there's no way that he can see anything uh, out through those bandages. And uh, I agreed. I watched him do it, and I said, there's no way he could see anything. Um, so then he went through an explanation, and then he, he did a couple of demonstrations of psychic ability. And one of the things that he did was he asked for a volunteer. There were a couple of volunteers, but one of the things he asked when he asked for a volunteer, I raised, well, I raised my hand. I, I figured he could see me, or maybe he couldn't. But anyway, I said, I'll, I'm, I'll volunteer, and I was in the back. And, and um, he said, oh, fine. And he said, um, he said I want you to uh, uh, take a dollar bill or any bill out of your wallet which I did. I had a number of bills in my wallet. And it was dark where I was standing. It was kind of in a shadowy area of the living room. And Susie stood right next to me. Uh, and uh, I, I took a, a bill out of my wallet. And he said, if I, can, if, if I can tell you the serial number of that bill, can I have it? And <laughs> it was all I could do just not start laughing. I said, sure, sure, go ahead. And uh, he did it. I was standing there looking, the bill was this close to my face, and I was standing there reading the numbers as he read them off, the numbers and the letters of that bill, and he got them, every one of them right. Now keep in mind, I had several bills in my wallet, so he didn't know which one I took. Even if someone had planted the bill, what's the odds that I'm going to take that one? But my wallet was always on me from the time I arrived at Robert Fisher's and drove over, so I, to this day, don't know how he did that. I've been told it's a trick. If it's a trick and somebody knows how he did it, please put it in the comments. Then came, he, 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 would, he would pick up these envelopes and hold them to his head, and he would call out for various people, and the various people would stand, and, or, and, or, or they'd say, yes, I'm here, and he would answer the questions. And these were, these were specific questions. These, these were very specific questions he was answering. And I could tell by the reaction that a lot of these people were just amazed by what his answers were. And then he called out, and I knew he was calling me. And I said, yes, I'm here. And he said, well, and I had written two questions. I said, one, I didn't tell Susie what the questions were, but I said, one, am I the father of this little boy that lives at Susie's home and is her adopted brother, the family's adopted brother? And secondly, um, how can you prove that to me? Those are my two questions. So he, he put it up there and he said, well, to answer your first question, the answer to your first question is yes. It was that simple, one word answer. And I thought, well, okay, that was a bit of a, 
shocked, but but I thought, how is he how is he going to prove this to me? And he said, as to your second question, he said, I'm just going to tell you, and you're going to have to think about this, but it'll explain it to you why you are. I'm going to tell you about an Indian blanket, and that's all I'm going to tell you. And then he went on to the next person. Well, when he first told me that, it didn't quite dawn on me. And then about five minutes later, it hit me because I couldn't stop thinking about it. There was an afternoon when Susie and I, I was driving her home up in the canyons, and um, we stopped at Michael Berry's house, who was a friend of ours. Michael was the son of uh, the actor Gene Berry. Uh, most of you are too young to remember him, but Gene Berry was a, had a TV series, Burke's Law, and at Western uh, uh, Bat uh, Masterson, where he had a had like a like a cane that he used like a gun. It was, he was a working actor and a very nice man. And Michael, uh, he was a friend of ours, and we were just going to stop by there and see him. Well, when we got to the house, uh, the housekeeper answered the door, and no one was home. And I said, well, we're supposed to meet Michael. And well, she knew me. So she said, well, just go up to his room and wait for him up there. She was busy doing whatever she was doing. I said, fine. So I went upstairs, and we're sitting in, we're in Michael's room waiting for Michael. And, of course, we've got time on, on our hands. We're young. We're, we're, we're boyfriend, girlfriend. And so we decided we were going to, uh, this one thing led to another, and we were going to make love together. But we, we were very cautious about the thought of using Michael's bed. That wasn't going to happen. Not only that, the maid had already cleaned his room up. And so we couldn't figure out what we were going to do, but we saw an Indian blanket on the floor of Michael's bedroom. And we talked about that Indian blanket. Was there some special thing about it? Should we lay down on the floor? Should we pick up the blanket? Is there some significance of this? Is it valuable? Do we want to be laying on it and all that? And we decided we just laid on the blanket. That was the Indian blanket. Now there's no way, and that I believe was was the day, the afternoon that this boy was conceived. There is absolutely no way that Dr. Ireland could have known that. It took me five minutes to remember it. Uh, he could not have known that. And uh, so that was uh, that was my introduction to Dr. Ireland, and it was uh, it was impressive. Uh, after that, there was another showing that I went to at uh, Glenn Ford's house, and then I had a private reading with him. He was living in, uh, in Palm Springs, and uh, years later, I had some really important things uh, going on in my life, and I decided I was going to look up Ireland. And somebody said, you ought to see a psychic. I said, what if he's around? He was in, in Palm Springs, and I went down there and had a, a meeting with him, and he was very helpful. Uh, following the, uh, the showing of Dr. Ireland, he, uh, I think, I guess he just kind of stood around in the living room and talked to people and uh, my uh, Robert Fisher came to me and said you know there there are a, a group of people that are going to meet Mae West if you'd like to meet her she's going to be meeting some people in the dining room and she stayed all night upstairs she never came down and I thought well I'm not going to get to see Mae West but I'm in her house and Ireland's really exciting and so that was enough for me but then uh, uh, Fisher came to me and said, if you'd like to meet her, we're going to meet her in the dining room and you can come with us. I said, oh, great. Susie stayed in the, in the living room, as I remember. And I said, I'll be back. And I went. And I walked in this dining room and it was very dark. And uh, you know the movies where they have uh, the, the stands and then the, the felt ropes go, you know, on like that to make where, where people walk. Well, the, there was those two... Uh, like a corridor of those things, I forgot what they're called, uh, which led to uh, Mae West. And she was standing on an apple cart or something. There's no way that she was that tall. She had to be, because I was eye level when I finally got to her, and she, she had to be, I forgot what her height, but she wasn't very tall. So she was standing on some kind of a crate or something, and she was dressed in all white, and she must have taken hours to put her makeup on. I mean, it was absolutely perfect, red lipstick, and she had that platinum wig, and she was beautifully lit. The lighting of her was had to have been set forever, and she was probably used to meeting people, and so somebody had come in and set those lights, and they were always there for her. And uh, so she stood in this darkened room, almost like angelic. I mean, she absolutely looked angelic to me. And I was in the line, and I'm working my way up. And I can see she's talking to people, and then she spends about a minute or so, and then they, they move, and the next person would come. And uh, Fisher and my mother went before me, and then I was behind them. 
And uh, I didn't know what I was going to say to her. It never occurred to me what I was going to say to her other than, you know, and I didn't want to make a fool of myself, and I certainly didn't want to ask her something trivial. I wanted to be somewhat, you know, I didn't know a lot about her. So when I finally got up to her, I was mesmerized by her eyes. She had a, a look, a presence about her, that face, that was really uh, quite spellbinding. And uh, at that moment, I could remember her from My Little Chickadee, that great line, why don't you come up and see me sometime, that she read to W.C. Fields. Well, I was a huge fan of W.C. Fields. I loved Fields in high school. I watched all of his movies. I thought the man was hysterical. And uh, so when I got up to her, I did the obvious thank you for your hospitality and allowing me into your home and so forth. And I, I don't know if I told her she looked beautiful. She, she had this big muscular man standing next to her that I forgot that was her bodyguard but close friend. He was always by her side when she was in public like this. And he was standing right there. And so I didn't want to make any odd comment. So I thanked her for her hospitality and all that. And then... I said, I got to ask them. So I said, you know, uh, and she was, she was looking at me like, well, did you, you know, do you have a question? And I said, so I finally, I said, you know, I've been a, for years, I've been a huge fan of W.C. Fields. And uh, I know that you've made a lot of movies with him and you, you know, you've been around him trying to work with him. What was it like working with Fields? And she looked at me and she said, well, it's, uh, it's all in my book. And she smiled and I said, well, well thank you. And, uh, that was my time to leave, and I left. I thought, well, I guess that was a good question. At least I was I knew something about her life, and I felt okay about it. And I wasn't planning on getting her book, but anyway, uh, how I went. Uh, 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, Fisher's driving. My mother's in front. Susie and I are in back. We're driving along. We're having an idle conversation. And Fisher says to me, by the way, what did you ask Mae West? And I said, oh, you know, I didn't really know uh, what to ask her. So I told her uh, that I was a big fan of W.C. Fields and I knew she worked with him and I, I, I would just ask her what it was like to work with W.C. Fields. <laughs> and he practically slammed on the brakes and I hear him say, you what? And I, I could see him reverberating like his hands were gripping the wheel. <laughs> I didn't know. I said, why? Was there some problem with that? Why? Why? What's, why? What are you asking me that for? And he said, everybody in the business knows you never, ever bring up that name to her. She absolutely detested the man. <laughs> well, I guess at that moment I realized I wasn't going to be invited back to Mae West's home anytime soon. And uh, so that was my evening with Dr. Richard Ireland and uh, meeting Mae West. <laughs>